Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> this is Leanne Wyville from Presence Communications. Welcome to Innovate Queensland, it's a GRID webinar, GRID standing for Giving Research and Ideas Direction. I'm working with Impact Innovation to deliver the Innovate Queensland program, which supports the Queensland Government's $405 million Advanced Queensland Initiative. Today's webinar guest is Queensland's Chief Entrepreneur, Mark Sowerby. Mark's going to be talking rather than presenting, so if you keep the webcam on, you'll get the most out of today's webinar. Just while we're waiting for other people to connect to us, I'll go through some of the tools we'll be using for those people who haven't viewed a Citrix GoToWebinar before. So your screen looks something like this. You've got slide and you've got your own dashboard here. If you want to make sure that you keep that control panel on the whole time, um, you click on the view here and uncheck auto hide and that way it'll stay on and you'll be able to use the interactive tools. Now if possible, um, if your connection has the bandwidth, enlarge your webcam screen so that you can see Mark speaking and you can do that through the tools up here. And if that's not an option for you, don't worry, Mark's very easy to listen to, it's not critical that you, there are no slides that you have to look at, so um, just tune in as best you can. A couple of interactive tools that we have, and I'll be testing one in a moment. Um, one is the raise your hand feature, and the other is type in a question. So throughout the webinar, if you have a question for Mark, please type it in there and then we'll address questions afterwards. He's going to uh, do a, a brief speech and then answer questions. We have uh, quite a number of people, well over 100 people for today's um, webinar, so we may not get through all our questions live, but we will certainly address any questions that come through the system. Okay. Now, in a moment, you're going to um, see Mark, and uh, while he's he's preparing to for his speech, I'm going to explain why Mark was appointed as the first chief entrepreneur for any state in Australia. Uh, Mark is one of Queensland's most successful entrepreneurs, and is best known for his role as the founder and former managing director of Blue Sky Alternative Investments Limited. Blue Sky is, is a successful ASX listed diversified funds manager focused on alternative assets investing across private equity, venture capital, private real estate, water, infrastructure, hedge funds and agriculture and possibly kitchen sinks. From its early beginnings in Brisbane, Blue Sky has now grown into one of Australia's top 300 listed companies employing over 80 people in Australia and New York. Mark remains an advisor and significant shareholder in the business. Ten years after starting Blue Sky, Mark handed the business over to the team to spend more time with his family and to help with projects that have a positive social impact. Mark received the University of Queensland Vice-Chancellor's Alumni Excellence Award in 2015 and was recognised as Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year for Queensland. He's also completed a successful crossing of the English Channel. Mark serves on the board of Starlight Children's Foundation and for Racing Queensland. He is originally from Warren in Western New South Wales and studied Agricultural Science at the University of Queensland and a Graduate Diploma of Applied Finance and Investment through the Securities Institute of Australia. He also has a Masters of uh, Business Administration from UQ. So now I'm just going to check that everyone, can you see Mark? If you can't see Mark, um, we'll need to know, but hands up, use the hands up tool and let me know if you can see Mark. Oh, this is looking good. Yes, okay, so everyone can see Mark. Well, Mark, your turn to talk. Welcome to the webinar. Thanks, Leanne, and for those of you that can see me, I'm sorry. Uh, you'd be better off if you couldn't, but hopefully uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the chat that we have this afternoon. Um, so thanks, Leanne, for the introduction. Uh, it's an interesting role, I think, now um, taking on this Chief Entrepreneur's job 
Uh, and I guess if you think about the context of that around what Leanne said, um, it's around that social good piece. And so where uh, where can I personally have an impact that I think leverages the stuff that I've learned over the last 20 years and particularly the last 10 uh, through the Blue Sky journey and how we can use that to uh, take Queensland from being seen to be you know, well down the rung uh, in terms of its work in the entrepreneur and startup space and a whole bunch of other things and take Queensland to that leading position and, and most certainly I think that the Office of Chief Entrepreneur will help us do that. Um, so what I thought I'd do uh, for the discussion today is, is really open it um, really broadly to lots of questions around different things and the first thing I usually like to do is to go through and uh, talk through the Blue Sky journey and so and try and give an idea of what it is like <laughs> to be uh, you know in an entrepreneurial space and, I, and and maybe at the end of that we can talk about um, uh, how entrepreneurship can change uh, not only the state and the economy, but how it can change your own life. Because I don't think that the innovation tag word and everything else and motherhood statements that are being used are really connecting with people, but, but changing your life can, and certainly that's been my experience. Um, and certainly going to be open to a lot of questions uh, and happy to answer hard ones and also deep questions, so happy to answer personal ones as well. Um, so uh, maybe if I kick off now with uh, a little bit of background. So you heard the background that I studied ag science. Um, so ag science to private equity uh, is not a usual path. Um, the reality was is that my background um, from little town Warren west of Dubbo and then we moved up to another small town but it was big compared to Warren which is Moree which is northern New South Wales. Um, and my family had sent us to a boarding school which was on a farm uh, in Tamworth, 20 kilometres out of town. So it's about as insulated uh, an upbringing as you, as you can have and I'm 45 now so this is pre-email, pre-internet, uh, pre-mobile phones, all those things so it's, a, it's an incredibly isolated um, and insulated environment and so finding your way out of that and particularly for those of you that are on this uh, webinar that are from regional areas is that there's regional challenges and geographic challenges um, can sometimes be turned to your strength and so, uh, so I studied ag science um, I backpacked around the world for a year when I finished it because I really didn't know what I wanted to do, and uh, I knew I, I knew particularly when I was I was I always tell the story I was in a uh, a broccoli paddock uh, just outside of Pittsworth uh, in Queensland, so west of Toowoomba. It was I don't know minus two degrees, and I was running through the fields checking for bugs. Uh, so I was an agronomist by trade, and um, and so part of that job is that you're running through fields, checking for insects, doing bug counts and then advising farmers on what they should use to kill those insects and maintain control of their crops. Uh, so it's not the most glamorous job and I was 22 years old and I was thinking, my God, you know, how, how, how am I going to, you know, the, 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 the job for me was going to end up being where I'd be the guy in the car with other young guys or girls like me running around these fields. So I didn't feel like that I was going to be maximising my potential and the prospects of my limited life. So I made a decision that I needed to really try and change direction and um, and so I sent my CV <coughs> around the world and I printed it up on a you know dot matrix printer and there's no LinkedIn or anything else to help you with all this stuff as there is now. Um, and I sent this CV to around, about 100 people around the world, um, anyone that was a connection of mum and dad's or mine anyone that I knew at all really got a copy of this pretty, pretty pathetic CV um, and, uh, and sent it around the world. I really was just going for that random moment of trying to find a way out of the hole that I was in and, uh, and I, I got really lucky. I got a job, uh, I got a phone call from a guy in Sydney, uh, his name was Hilton Lobb and, and Hilton uh, called me up and said, Mark, um, you've sent your CV around the world. Uh, a family called Wheel Brothers Cotton, so a cotton trading company based in Alabama. They're interested in having a chat to you. They're looking for a young uh, guy. Had to be a guy because the places they were going to work with the danger. Um, under 26 uh, to become a trainee and work for them in Alabama. Now Alabama doesn't seem that attractive, but when you're in Pittsworth, it's awesome. And so uh, and so they they said, well, your your CV. Um, we sent we sent a, a, a telex and a fax around the, to 18 offices around the world, and um, and uh, your name came up four times, and uh, and that's that random 
opportunity because I sent 100 CVs out. They said, what are the chances of that? We're not going to interview anybody else. We're going to fly to Australia and we're going to interview you. <clears throat> they didn't. They flew here and they interviewed me at the, what is now the Stanford Plaza. It was the Bofa Heritage then. And then uh, a few months later, they offered me the job, and so I took a job as a trainee cotton trader living in Montgomery, Alabama, which is, um, uh, you know, it was effectively a big moree to be quite honest. But it was, uh, but it was still, um, you know, incredibly glamorous compared to where I'd been. <coughs> and um, and part of that was, uh, you know, I was incredibly poor actually. So this uh, this Jewish family, um, you know, were, who were incredibly wealthy. I mean, they had 31 A's and um, and all this incredible wealth. They really didn't had the concept around what it, what it cost to live <laughs> as a 24 year old um, and I remember losing from I was about 96 kilos I've been playing rugby then and by the time I left uh, Alabama I was 83 kilos so that was starvation um, so I was living in a in a one bedroom apartment uh, with one of those terrible Murphy beds that you sort of pull out of the wall uh, I was so poor and surrounded by you know, druggos and all sorts of things um, but you know, such an adventure when you're 24 years old, and and what I realised very quickly when I got there was just how lucky I had been. Uh, an amazing family, six generations of of knowledge, trading, wealth. Um, uh, been through civil the civil war in America. Uh, um, I've never been caught in a bust. Uh, some great rules, and over the eight years I worked for them, I worked for them in 40 something countries. My job ended up being that I was the troubleshooter. They had a problem in the country, I would fly in. Um, and it might be I'd fly into Honduras for um, three days to try and get a cotton shipment out uh, out of there, uh, which might involve all sorts of underhand dealings to try and get this these these deals done. And um, uh, and it was a great grounding. And certainly not that I don't mean that's a great grounding for chief entrepreneur role of all, of course. But um, but but learned a lot. And so I came back to uh, to Australia, um, fixed up their operation here for them, did a finance degree and an MBA, and. Uh, and then really had a sense uh, that it was that I wanted to to start my own business. I wanted to be my own boss, and I, I wasn't one of those people that hated uh, hated working for other people. I don't think you need to be one of those complete outliers that are looking for um, you know looking for something where you're the boss and a dictator and all those things. I was already the boss of their operation here anyway, so I didn't feel like I was working in some big corporation. Um, but I did feel that I had more to give. Uh, so most certainly there was a sense of self that I had more to give and that um, and I started to feel like there were no limits to what could be achieved and then uh, during my MBA I had another you had these sort of sliding door moments I always tell lecturers in universities and and mentors and people to be very careful about what you say because you can change someone's life for the good or for the better and um, and particularly when you're sort of young and really listening and really trying to to take on um, everything that that people that are experienced tell you, and I've had a lecturer in um, my MBA at UQ, and uh, and he said to me, um, so I did three degrees, uh, and I had a very mixed academic record, I have to say, and I was very lucky to get through the first one. Uh, it took a bit longer than it's supposed to. <laughs> Second one, I got through okay, but nothing spectacular. I would have been at the wrong end of the bell curve, but got through it, and then. Um, with my MBA, I started to ramp it up a little bit, but I got a high distinction in this subject, and it was strategy. And he said to me, um, he, and it, he was Swedish, and the Swedish and uh, Germans and those sorts of people, are, I think, are particularly uh, abrupt and brutal in their assessment. And, and he said to me, Mark, um, uh, uh, I've been talking to other lecturers, it appears you have no talents um, uh, other than. Uh, with uh, in our particular in this particular subject, you can connect the dots, and you need to find a job where you know you're thinking at iterations above other people and some of this stuff. And I'm going to give you the only high distinction in this in this particular subject, and you should find something to do with it that that, that requires that. And he said, "Have you thought about trading?" And I said, oh, "I was already cotton trader and, and doing quite well." And he said, "What about private equity?" And and so the seed was sown. And um, and so I started to think about what I really enjoyed working for this company, Wheel Brothers. I rebuilt their Australian operation for them, and I realised that I loved building their business uh, even more than I enjoyed trading, which I loved. And uh, and so then I started to really think about starting my own company. And and only just a few months later, I I resigned from that business, um, and it was about to start what is what became Blue Sky, uh, Blue Sky Private Equity. But then another moment came, and I got a phone call from uh, from a farmer co-op in Adelaide from a recruiter who said. Um, uh, Mark, 
where you hear you've just left Will Brothers, where you'd be interested in you running this business and turning it around. It's a bit of a mess. Um, and can you come down and help us? No one had a look and I knew what to do with it. So at 32, I went to Adelaide for three years. My wife and I were in, in what she calls the breeding years, so we were stuck basically, <laughs> um, doing nothing at all other than, other than um, looking after babies. So Adelaide seemed like a good place to be for that. And um, and so, uh, so, so we went down there for three years, uh, saved that business, and turned it around, which was very much, I think, a, you know, in hindsight, the reflection of the group that I had, um, not my own skills, sadly. And um, and then, uh, and then I, uh, this, the, this sort of trigger, this inflection point came that I've been waiting for for 20 years. And uh, as obscure as it's going to sound, it was the separation of water and land title in agriculture. So the history of that area was that. Um, uh, when irrigation dams were built, they were attaching water licences to those dams and they were being attached to the land and they were encouraging farmers to, to really take on um, uh, soldier settlements in the south, uh, but up here it was irrigation and to try and use that water to try and have more intensive uh, irrigation and, and the separation of those two asset classes really gave an opportunity where the water was much more valuable than the land. And so I started Blue Sky Private Equity in July 2006, which is just over 10 years ago. Um, so at that point, I decided to, I, I remember talking to my wife Heidi and I said to her, um, okay, it's time for me to start my own business. And she said, that's great. And I said, so we need to sell everything, <laughs> which is everything. So uh, we had a half a unit at Lennox Head that we owned. We had a house in Adelaide a few shares and a bit of cash and stuff and everything was sold and that left us with sort of one and a half million dollars plus of cash um, after working hard. I was 35 years old and um, and really ready to to try and take on the world and there's the business plan to be frank was pretty pathetic. Um, uh, what I had realised when you think about your own work I'd realised that um, yeah, you, don't, you don't want to be at work and hating the fact that you're there. I really enjoyed building businesses, so my cunning plan was to be building our business, uh, so Blue Sky, whilst also helping other people build theirs. So Blue Sky Private Equity was born, and the first deal we did was a startup, which is uh, just insane because startups are hard, and let alone your own startup. So we started, uh, helped start a business called Beach Burrito Company. So for those of you that eat Mexican food, and for those of you that are in Queensland, there's one in the Valley and one in West End and one at Coolangatta. Uh, please feel free, go and get a 10% discount when you mention my name. That doesn't happen like that actually. Um, I would charge you more. So um, there's about 15 or 20 stores around Australia and um, uh, all, not franchised, all company owned. And that, so that business has gone really, really well. Um, and so we started the business then and uh, and we had the water idea. Uh, we were doing some private equity. I saw some opportunities in real estate in Townsville of all places. This is obviously a little while ago, back in 06, 07, and we made some good money there. Um, and so suddenly we had a private equity into real estate business, private equity and venture capital business, and this water fund, which you could call infrastructure. And, um, and then I had the good sense to go and do a, a short course uh, at Harvard. Um, and when you get to a certain age, once you've done your sort of base degrees, the, the short courses at the great institutions, I have to tell you, are just a great refresher and um, and incredible contacts. And so I, I I got into this private equity course, and it was October 2007, so it's Harvard's private equity course. So if you think back to 2007, um, that's pre-GFC, I mean, private equity is about as sexy as it can get, and everyone wants to be there, and they had thousands of applications for this course with 80 people. And um, I've since become good, really good friends um, with Josh Lerner, who's the professor that runs that program, and he's the number one private equity and venture capital person in the world. And in fact, is arriving in Queensland tomorrow for us. And and uh, and Josh said to me, we looked at all these applications, and he said, there's this ridiculous application from this company from Brisbane with two staff and 25 million in assets under management, which was my forecast for the year. It had nothing to do with what we actually had. I think we had five million under management. Um, there's all these great firms from around the world trying to send their young proteges and management teams to, and, and they said, we just like the idea of having a startup private equity term with a stupid name like Blue Sky in our course, and they love diversity. And so um, so I got into the course, and just did, it's just one of those week-long things. But um, but the, the, the turning point was that I had the good sense to know that 18 months or 15 months into the business, that it was time to sort of take a step back and have a look at everything that was going on and just get my head out of it and going overseas and getting on planes is always good for that. So um, so I stood back and spent a week, as if you ever go to Harvard, um, 
in Boston to have a look. There's a double tree and it's right near there. I stayed there for a week and and just pure luck. Uh, the lecturers were all still there all the week. All these they're different to our lecturers here. They're just absolutely commercial animals. They all own their own venture capital firms. They've all um, they've owned pieces of Facebook. They're independently wealthy. They write a book a year just for fun, and so and they actually sell them. They don't just put them on you know onto textbook lists. And so um, and so for all the lecturers who are listening, and I really apologise for that. <laughs> and so um, and so what we did is um, it, you know, I've had this week, and then this lecturers. Um, just took me on their journey, but they took me through, and particularly Josh took me on this journey of, well, um, Australia is not going to be investing in just property and bonds and listed equities forever. Eventually, you'll catch up to the rest of the world, and we think that at least a quarter of the assets invested into in Australia by everyone will be into into private markets or and hedge funds, which is which is alternatives and. And so what that is is venture capital and private equity. It's private equity into real estate, so just unlisted real estate, which is not that complicated. It's hedge fund, it's infrastructure, and what is now called real assets, which is agriculture and timber and um, uh, water as well. And so all those things, became, which are all available in the stock market mostly, but this is in the private markets. And so um, Josh said to me, um, uh, "This you, you can build a business here that uh, is solving for a problem that Australians don't know they've got. And when you're building a business for a problem people don't know they have, then there's a big education process convincing them that they have a problem. But ultimately the financial crisis certainly flushed that out for us when people saw the volatility of what they owned. And and so I started uh, started to really think about uh, what was possible. So I went and bought a hedge fund business. Um, so then we had all four of those pillars. Um, and we set a goal to list our business uh, five years, um, not long after inception. So it was going to be, we set a goal to list by December 2011. And if there's one tip I can give you is that, um, is that uh, you know, the structure that we use to get there is a really effective way to manage both your business and your life and that we, um, we broke our year into six month bite sized chunks. And so for everyone that has an annual budget, you will know that you do most of the work for your budget at the end. Uh, that's human nature. So if you do six month budgets and six month bite size chunks, you'll find that you'll achieve things in half the time, um, and you won't miss your targets. Uh, we did a five year plan, and the five year plan is not a detailed plan. The five year plan is a story, uh, and what's our story going to be at five years? And so the story that we said was uh, that we were going to be listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. Now that sounds really boring, but in fact, if you think through, to get listed on the ASX, we needed to have uh, a seriously good team with a great track record in investing. We need to have credibility in the market, a balance sheet that was sufficiently strong to allow us to list. Uh, and of course, all the compliance mechanisms needed to be through our accounting, through our uh, funds management, and everything else that we did had to be uh, impeccable for us to list successfully on the ASX. And so uh, in, we actually listed a month late, which was disappointing. Um, but in January 2012, we listed uh, Blue Sky as an alternative asset manager with a market capitalization of $33 million and a balance sheet of $7.5 million of cash and 25 staff and $180 million in assets under management, which wasn't the forecast, that was real. That was, uh, we didn't make that one, that one up. And, um, and we listed. And, uh, and so then being on the market, so we've been on the market for the last five years, so that business has now grown to a market cap of 500 to $550 million. We've got $2.5 billion under management. Our investor day is on the next two days, which is why I'm here wearing a tie and everything else, which is a disaster for me. I'm a t-shirt man. Um, uh, and we have 1,500 investors coming to 2,000 investors coming to our investor day on Thursday, 800 for dinner at City Hall in Brisbane. Um, and the investment track record of that team has been just a sub 17% compounding through the financial crisis net of fees. Um, the stock has been one of the top five performing stocks in the country. And, um, and so, uh, but through the course of that, uh, and it sounds all wonderful when you get to that point, and the reality is the business is going to be a hell of a lot bigger than it is today. This business is much more important uh, to the Australian economy and to these markets than, um, than anyone that works here. Um, but the reality is, is that the insanity that is required uh, to get through those difficult times uh, it becomes... Um, a real problem. So uh, you know, you, you all would have seen 
entrepreneurs, you know, men and women, that you look at them and you think, my God, they're absolutely nuts. And um, and you know, you listen to them and they're dynamic and they're aggressive and they're bouncing around and uh, high energy. And the reality is, is that after a while, they they probably weren't always like that. And after a while, um, when you've got your own business, it becomes self fulfilling because you actually need that level of relentless energy and insanity to get through all the horrible things that happen to you from people ripping you off in your own organisation, so stealing from you, uh, people selling out on you, um, people stealing contracts and all the stuff that happens, uh, all those things happen to you and you just get these body blows one after another all the way through and, you, and it never stops. Um, so for me personally, I recognised at the seven year mark that we were going to be where we are today. Uh, I could see that this business was going to be a multi-billion dollar business and so um, decided to um, decided to uh, swim the English Channel. Now, uh, sadly for me, I'm not a particularly good swimmer and uh, and so I had to um, spend a year of training for the training, so I'm also quite old. So what happens is as you get older, you've got to stretch more and it takes a lot longer to get yourself you know, fit enough for these sorts of things and also mentally prepared. So I did a year of training for the training, um, during which you know I had a, a couple of failure points um, and it's always interesting talking about the failures. So for anyone on here that's from Sydney or anyone that goes to Sydney quite a lot, when you fly into Sydney uh, and you fly over the Bondi Beach uh, area, there's a swim from Bondi Beach to Watson's Bay. It's ten. It's a ten-kilometre swim, and um, and it's a. It's it felt very sharky actually. I wouldn't recommend anyone ever go out there. It just felt horrible, uh, deep and dark. And they tell me the fishermen there tell me it's a shark super highway, uh, which I didn't know before I went out there. It was a 10k swim and we had a current against us and I didn't finish the swim. And I'm only a year out from swimming the channel. I can't finish a 10k swim, so that makes it. Um, I, I remember getting out of the water. I said to my wife who was there to help. She said that. Um, uh, I said I can't swim the channel next year, so I'll be pulling the pin. A couple of months later, I was in England. I went down to Dover. I couldn't help it. I went down to have a look and see where it was all about. I went to swim in the water, and it was bloody cold. Uh, my head exploded when I jumped in. I swam around for 45 minutes, and I went and sat in a pub and had a beer and thought about it, and um, and I uh, and decided um, that I would do it and film myself doing it to make myself do it. Um, and that then led to uh, you know a year long journey of intensive training and adaptation. So my body changed shape. Um, I didn't do anything except for swim and stretch and work uh, for that year. Lived in New York for a while, um, got used to the cold, learned how to embrace the cold rather than to hate it when you jump in and you get that terrible feeling at the start. It's like most things that are hard in life, you're better off sort of diving in and, and focusing on the good stuff. So you know, I learned to focus on the inner core of warmth and, and to get my body warmed up and to get into it. Um, and then also uh, learned a lot about nutrition and then mental preparation. And um, uh, if anyone uh, if anyone gets really bored, um, there's a on online video, online documentary actually of the Channel Swim. If you just look up Mark Salvi um, English Channel Swim, it'll come up now. I think it, there's enough people that have watched it. We had it on Vimeo because we raised money for a charity. So I was going to do this privately and it was just a personal journey but my wife told me that was selfish and so we raised a million dollars for Starlight Children's Foundation uh, in Queensland off the back of that swim which is I think a great reflection of the high quality people um, that I happen to know and, and I took them on the journey with me a little bit as well. Um, so I completed that channel swim in August last year. It's about a 20% strike rate of people that get across the channel over history so it's, a, it's quite a horrible day. Um, and then spend a lot of the last year recovering and, and one of the things when you do something like that is it breaks you down and it's the reason I did it actually was it breaks you down into your core component parts and, um, and so a lot of that insanity and a lot of the characteristics that I was displaying as a human being which were pretty ordinary, uh, I just needed to be able to offload those and get back to the core person of your was after all these years of insanity and um, and so the channel swim was very effective for me in doing that and the outcome of that was is that I decided to retire uh, from the business uh, which I did announced in August and finished in the end of September. I still own a lot of shares, I'm in the Blue Sky offices today so I'm always be uh, with Blue Sky but the reality is um, is that I needed to hand the business over and I need to spend time with my 14 year old and 12 year old boys and um, and my lovely wife although I think it's an, she's adapting 
to that right now. Maybe she needed a year of training for the training, to be quite honest. Um, so we're adapting to that now. And then, so that sort of leads to falling into this role. And um, so we, I mentioned Josh Lerner earlier on, the Harvard guy that gave me the clue as to what we could build. Um, he, uh, he also, you know, being the number one person in the world in this space, uh, we had a sense in, within the Blue Sky business, which has got its head office in Brisbane, but it's all around the world now. Um, uh, we had this sense that Queensland was actually taking off. And this is three years ago. So we could see this startup um, and self um, managed super fund things starting to connect up. And people were starting to think, well, I'm not starting investing into these. And then people were deciding they would start their own business rather than go and work for corporates or whatever they might do or government. And, and so we started to really see um, really see some traction, and we could we sense we sensed this was a wave that was coming. So I asked Josh Lerner with the government to do a um, a particular piece of work for us around um, around where was Queensland at, and the reality is is that we're in a bad place. So uh, the way Josh described our business, our, our state was um, uh, he'd never seen a state with more R and less D, so more research and less development. So proportionally, the amount of research going on here was just incredibly large. Um, and but on the other side, uh, uh, we had virtually no development or commercialisation of those ideas. In fact, no connection. And one of the problems with the research was that there was way too much basic research. So research without a goal. So you need a certain amount of that, but we had too much basic research. So how do we how do we recalibrate that? And and Josh, out of that came a whole bunch of recommendations and. It's really exciting when you're you know, a non-government person with no idea how to manage public policy to see that report has now formed approximately 40% of the Advanced Queensland program. Um, and one of the outcomes, be careful what you wish for because one of the outcomes of that was the Chief Entrepreneur's Office and, um, uh, and, uh, and so with me retiring it seemed um, you know, logical to the government for me to, to spend some time setting up that office and getting it going. So now I'm in that role uh, for 12 months uh, doing that uh, Part time, although it's really full time, uh, for free. Uh, so pro bono because I think you've got to be giving back, and uh, and so this is a great way to give back. So I give back through that and through the Racing Queensland uh, board in particular. So the racing industry in Queensland is a bit of a basket case and really needs some help. And so my guy Steve Wilson, who's the chairman, and I are turning that one around. Um, so the office itself. So I'm going to open to questions really soon. So start getting your questions ready. Um, I think the. Uh, if they're not already coming through, um, the, 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 the office itself. So really, uh, one of the real challenges for the private sector and for the public sector is actually talking to each other. So it's communication and translation. And I've seen that already. And uh, my initial, after doing this for a month and a bit, there's a couple of initial assessments is um, that being a private sector person with virtually no experience dealing with government at any level, because we just didn't ever deal with government, um, I always had this perception that that people in the private sector worked harder, uh, and and uh, that's not true. Uh, uh, my experience has been, I've been amazed and pleasantly surprised at the level of uh, incredible effort, uh, passion, um, and commitment that the people in uh, the department that I'm helping out have for what they do, and it's been really refreshing for me, and um, really sort of giving me a lot of energy as well. Uh, so our, our job is to really take that passion and to allow them to deliver that to the private sector, who so the private sector desperately needs, and the startup sector needs government, but as a catalyst. And if you look at the Advanced Queensland program that's in place, it's lost lots of small bits. Uh, it's quite well structured, there's a lot of really good ideas and there'll always be things we can do better, but by and large it's a bloody good program. And uh, and it has lots of little things that it does. So it's not there to pick winners or to, to drive dramatic change in one particular industry. But what it does do, it gives people a platform to get started. And ultimately, entrepreneurship is mostly around having the guts to get started and the conviction to stay the course. Um, so maybe at that point, I think, um, Leanne, I'll open it up to some questions because I've gone for 30 minutes, which is plenty. <laughs> Thanks very much, Mark. Um, now I'm just checking. I've got some questions here. Um, so now I'm just checking with my screen because I don't normally have my screen open at this point. Uh, we've got a question here from Kim. She says, "Hello, Mark. I have a company called Flip Flashcards. In the position as chief entrepreneur, how are you able to assist us 
up and coming entrepreneurs? Yeah, so um, so Kim, thanks for the question. It's a, it's actually a really common one that I've been getting since uh, since we came into the role. So you know, um, I, look, there's there's a, there's a couple of things around startups. So we were a startup ourselves, and and one of the big advantages, Kim, that I've had uh, in the Blue Sky journey is that we got to the point with our venture capital and private equity where we were looking at a thousand opportunities a year, literally one thousand, and that was. The stuff that came through from people that we tr that we trusted. So there's there's lots and lots of opportunities out there. And as a startup, I mean, firstly, congratulations on making the decision to start your own uh, business. Um, uh, in the chief entrepreneur's role, like our our job really is to um, firstly is to tell the story of entrepreneurship. And one of the things that I wish that I had been able to do when I started Blue Sky was to connect up with more people that have done it. And so one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to um, highlight at least 100 of Queensland's successful entrepreneurs and almost always, Kim, they're willing to give back. Um, they're always, almost always willing to sit down and talk and many of them actually will end up investing in, in, in those uh, opportunities. So yes, there's, no, there's no screens to help you in this space. It's all about networks. Um, so we'll be moving into an area which I think has been incredibly well thought through and set up called the precinct, which is in the valley. And for those of you that know the old TC Burn building, it's um, it's the old department store in the valley. So it's right in the centre of the valley where the you know the, um, the statues are, and uh, and the government has uh, effectively leased um, five and a half thousand square metres in that space. Um, and so that's going to be a platform and a mothership. I, I call it the mothership, which is where the money is going to be, uh, where Advanced Queensland will have some representation, uh, where we expect a whole bunch of incubators and accelerators will be based. Um, we know that we're going to have um, 140 odd people from Queensland Health, eHealth, are moving in there to give us sort of to break them out of the, the government mould and to get them thinking innovatively about solutions through uh, through tech. Um, we've got Data 61 moving in there uh, as well um, as part of CSIRO. So there's a whole bunch of groups moving in there. And being in that environment as a startup, and particularly it sounds like you've got a tech business, uh, it's just an absolute no brainer. And uh, so what government can do is government can provide a platform for you to succeed. Now, the success of um, uh, as an entrepreneur is, you know, I think really comes down to. A couple of key things is is if you think that you have an idea or an opportunity that is compelling and that is not just a trade or just for a fun or or is not going to get run over by a bus by someone with a better idea really quickly, um, if you think you've got something like that, then um, then the challenge is to stay the course with all the noise around you and um, and so I think one of the things that we can do through the chief entrepreneur's office is connect you up again with people to talk to that have been through that journey and also quite frankly to test um, your idea and your business and to say well have you thought about this or I'm sorry I don't think that'll work for these reasons and talking to lots of people and advisors doesn't help talking to people who have done it helps a lot. Um, through the Chief Entrepreneur's Office you know, the, the, if you look at the Advanced Queensland program uh, Kim I mean if you can't find some money in there for the stage of development you're, at, you're not you know you, you, you're not, you're not Paying attention, and although I would say that you're also not alone, <laughs> and by that I mean is that is that I, I've, I've always found it really hard, and I think people do find it hard to look at their websites and go, you know, where does what's the thing for me? What's the best? Is it an, an ignite grant, or where am I ready to go for the business development fund, or you know, I'm on a regional area and I can get a particular grant? And I, I think it's so hard to navigate those things, particularly in the time frames that you need as a startup, where you need to make a decision next week or even last week, um, and then running through a government process that might take four months can be really challenging. So within the precinct, we will um, have an advanced Queensland person that just knows those programs inside out. They're not a website. That's a real human being, and they can say, Kim, we've had a look at your business. Uh, Here's three successful applications and what they look like for this particular program. This is the program for you for this next stage. Uh, let me help you. And I think if we can start to do that, then we'll start to allocate the money to the right people, and it'll give you a leg up as well. Um, uh, so there's, there's there's lots and lots of stuff there. I, I have one saying, um, you know, one thing I've been saying to people a lot, and Kim, if you can't make it in Australia, you won't make it anywhere now because there's so much government support and private sector support for this space. 
that if you're doing the work and you're working hard and um, then then uh, then then you can find a way through. Uh, but it can take a lot of time. So remembering that I didn't feel like we had a business that was really substantial until the seven year mark and I was 35 when I started it, so I was 42 and I started off with one and a half, two million bucks to put into that business. Admittedly, it got down to seven eight hundred dollars which I did not tell my wife. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I couldn't pay the school fees on time. <laughs> so, um, so hopefully that answers some of your question, uh, Kim. But if you want to contact us, you can easily get a hold of us through the Chief Entrepreneur's Office and Bronwyn is running all that office uh, and we're starting to hire people and particularly from February onwards we'll be, I think, you know, resource stuff enough to give you a hand. Thanks, Mark. A uh, question from John. You mentioned research without a goal. What are your thoughts on building bridges between the great pool of research expertise and commercialisable or social capital outcomes? Yes, yeah, so so um, so the, you know there's a level of basic research that you have to have, um, so which is going to lead to that light bulb moment, or is going to connect up with some research in another country that's going to lead to something that changes the world. So um, so there's no doubt that that. That we need to have some basic research. The problem, I think, um, for the universities as well, uh, and for um, you know many of the other research organisations, is uh, that they're not really aiming for anything. And so, if you if you go to some other countries where um, you know you see the researcher drive in um, to his new lab, privately funded lab, and his Ferrari. <laughs> now, that's not something I would do. I drive a Hilux. Um, but you can see that that, that commercialisation has led to a particular outcome where they've been able to change their life. And I think that we've got way too many people allocating incredibly intelligent resources, um, amazing experience into things that at the end of their life will have likely never led to any particular outcome other than a contribution to that big pool of basic research. So the buzzword now, obviously, is to sort of you know, come back to your question, John, is to is the is this you know connection between commercialisation and research, and the reality is is that that's going to take a long time, uh, and it is happening naturally. So um, I'll take the universities as an example. The universities have really seen um, that there's a need for them to bring entrepreneurs through, bring their research through to commercial outcomes, and look at the royalty streams that um, that UniQuest has got from Gardasil now which then means they can reinvest that capital back into new ideas and new opportunities and they're basically fully funded for as long as they want to be. I think that's a really interesting model that's starting to work and it takes a long time. Um, now that we have a few examples of success, they have Spinifex and a few other ones as well, um, then I expect that you're going to start to see that sort of that light bulb moment where somebody's life, a researcher's life has changed and um, and um, uh, and but that researcher's life has changed and they start to think about, okay, what are the things that I can do to, to now perhaps solve an industrial problem or to solve a, a commercial problem. And, um, but, but, but interestingly, I think that concierge desk is, is a simple solution. Uh, so I was at QUT uh, recently and QUT are very dynamic and easy to communicate with, but if you're a business looking at QUT, you've got no idea who to contact to solve your problem. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's no. You, you, you contact one department, they flick you to another department, and um, and I think it's a really challenging thing for business to engage with big institutions. So having a concierge desk to say, okay, here's my problem. I've got a geospatial problem across Western Queensland that I'm trying to resolve. Can you help me? Or I've got a robotics problem. Can you help me? And getting connected up with the right people, and then having them incentivised to help uh, the corporates resolve those problems is a really easy way to get sort of that. Um, that connection and trust going, and once that happens, once those relationships are built, because all this stuff happens on the back of relationships and friendships and trust, it doesn't happen on the back of a website or a you know good pitch deck. It just doesn't. And so, building those relationships where that light bulb moment, where two people connect and say, "Here's an idea. Why don't we do this?" Or you see something that's being researched for, and you know there's a problem in America that you've heard about. Um, they're the moments that we're looking for, uh, and we need that across not just the research community but across entrepreneurship as well. Thanks, Mark. Um, good question here from Brooke. True investors in startups seem difficult to find, um, and I guess what mm. Brooke's situation is that she's having to pitch to earn a pitch place at an incubator to access yep. investment. So, do you yep. have any 
options for finding investors via another route? Yes, so um, so, so certainly that is it's, it's actually a good um, it's a really good training ground, Brooke. Um, so so it's interesting that you're going through that process. I think there'll be more and more of that, and in fact, I think the providers of those uh, opportunities will um, will also get better at sort of taking you on a journey and. Uh, so I would encourage you to continue to relentlessly pursue that actually that path in particular. It's um, it does help connect you up with investors as well. Uh, a lot of the money that we raised, Brooke, um, were through our friends, family, and personal contacts. And uh, a lot of people don't want to do that because they're scared that they might lose the money and or that it won't work. And then they'll have to deal with that at a family and friendship level. And in fact, that's the test. Um, because if your idea isn't good enough for your friends and your family to put their own money into and all your own money into, then it sure as hell isn't good enough for an Australian investor or anyone else to put their money into as well. And um, and so I, we, we always had a view that we weren't looking for money that was um, outside. We always looked for inside money first. And then we could say to people that were outside, look, I needed a million dollars. I've raised 400,000 from myself and all of our team and everything else that we've done. Um, and now, now you know, could you please invest in me rather than doing these pitch? But I mean, I've never invested into a pitch, uh, and I think in reality, that rarely, rarely happens. What usually happens that's the start of an engagement where you build some trust and friendships and and talk to someone for three to six months before getting some money. Um, so I think attending a lot of those events as well, Brooke, is really interesting to watch. For, so when you're on one side, where which you'll be doing, where you'll be pitching. And I love that you're pitching for the right to pitch. It's sort of like training for the right to swim, isn't it? And so you pitch for the right to pitch, uh, and that's all part of the journey and learning about what works and what doesn't. Um, but but I think ultimately, when you really want to raise money, that you've got to go back to your base relationships of people that you know. And now, when you're younger, that can be more challenging because um, you just haven't got those relationships. So it's mum and dad, and it's the uncles and aunts, and and they might not have the capacity to do very much. But anything that they do will be helpful and uh, and once again use that filter, that test which is very much around um, if it's not good enough for mum and dad to put money into and me to put money into then it's probably not good for anyone else to put money into. So so just just as a, like I often hear from, um, from you know in tech businesses and other groups that get venture capital money or angel money and they say you won't believe the valuation that I got for my business. So, you know, Got them at such a high price, it, it was never worth that, and and it's such a common thing because you're trying to preserve your equity whilst get enough cash to grow your business. So I understand the motivation. The problem is, is that always ends up in trouble, Brooke. And because if you don't deliver on what you said you were going on that valuation and give them an uplift, and it becomes very hard if you set yourself a goal that's you know so high, um, then ultimately you'll always end up in a legal battle. They will always come to you and say you misrepresented. You lied to us. You didn't deliver. You either get sacked and kicked out, and someone else will be running it, and your founder shares will be gone, or whatever. But it'll, it'll turn bad. Um, so when you're looking to raise that money, make sure that you value it appropriately for the risk. And we always used to when we were raising money. So if I ever sold any blue sky shares, I had this really simple rule book, which is I never sell shares at a price that I didn't think the person buying them off me from would make money out of. And I don't know who's buying them because it's a public company, but I'll never sell because I think it's reached a peak. I'm selling because I think it's got further to go. Um, and if you can park that greed component, um, then I think it's a really good start. And people will sense that in you. And as you learn how to express that thing and that value system, then you'll find that you'll probably get more money. So if you think about the investor problem, is that they're going to be investing into a private company they can't get out of, but they're backing one or two or three people with an idea. Uh, they really need to get a sense of you as a human being. And so one of the things to really practice around that is to um, understand who you are, first of all, which you can do through testing yourself through physical and mental challenges and lots of other things. Um, uh, also asking other people what they think of you uh, and how you, how you present to them. Um, but then also, you know, at, at the end of the day, really being out willing to open up and explain who you are and why you're desperate to do this. It can't be because I'd rather be doing this than working somewhere else. It has to be with a deep conviction, they're the people that actually get through the really difficult journey that it is of having a startup or or a new business or a young business and taking it to something worthwhile. Thanks, Mark. Uh, just a, a bit more on um, 
Investment. Sarah has a question. What is the risk appetite of the Angel VC market and how mm. should they work with and support the Advance Queensland agenda? So what, what, that, what was the name of that person, sorry? Sarah. Yeah? Sarah. Sarah. So Sarah, um, yeah, Sarah, great, great question. Um, so, so, uh, so yeah, it's a really, really good question. So, so let me sort of drill into that a bit. Um, so if you come back to the, when I told the story about Blue Sky and where it came from and, and this shift that had happened uh, overseas into, the, into private markets, we'll call it private markets, which broadly means um, investing into assets that are illiquid. And what that means is that you just can't buy and sell the shares or buy and sell that particular um, you know, financial instrument on an exchange on a daily basis. You just can't do it. So you, you, once you invest, you're stuck. And Australians have historically um, really stayed away from that. You've seen entrepreneurs and families do it. Uh, and that's actually, if you look at most of the really wealthy families in Australia, they've built a lot of their wealth through these private investments and private markets. Um, but in general, Australians have stayed away. And I think there's one really interesting, tr uh, there's two triggers, um, Sarah, that have changed that mentality. Um, the first of those is, is the shift to self-managed super funds. So if you're my age at 45 and say you've got half a million dollars in your self-managed super fund, and you can't touch any of that at this stage until you're 65. So there's no point having liquidity because you can't spend it anyway. <laughs> so not legally. Um, so you might as well invest that into things that you think you're going to grow, you don't need the liquidity, so you're happy to give up that, that liquidity premium uh, to access growth, because what you really want is you want growth. You want that money compounding up at 15 or 20 or five times money or whatever it's going to be. And so the change to self made super in the last five or six years, and so we started our business where I think Australia was about 24% of, the, of all the money in Australia was sort of in self made super or privately managed super, and now it's 40%. And so it's 31% in self-managed super fund trustees, but it's about 40% of the 100% that's available. So the rest of that's industry funds and retail funds. And so that 60% is actually has actually stepped away from this market a bit. And, and the people that are running into that opportunity are those that are private investors because they can't get the growth. The stock market today is at the same level it was when I started Blue Sky 10 years ago. It has not moved. Um, bonds are a scary place to be. Property markets feel like they're pretty well overvalued. So if you want to get to a point where um, uh, where you're making some money out of your investments, then you have to go into growth equity. You have to look off market. And venture capital and angel investing and private equity. So if you go angel investing, then venture capital, and then private equity, so early stage private equity, so not debt, but growth equity. That's becoming a really interesting place for people to start to invest. And we saw that evolution in the US. They had a 401k system, which is like our self managed super. So, so those two things are structural change as well as the change in markets and that these markets are broadly at least fully valued or close to it. So if you want to find that opportunity, you look off market. And I had, um, Sarah, I had a um, Jared Minak, M-I-N-A-C-K, who's a famous economist that I really, uh, in, in Australia who I really like. Um, he's always a bit bearish and negative, but he's also very pragmatic, I think, and um, particularly since he got out of the banks and he's he got his own business. Um, he did this chart for me a little while ago, um, and I asked him to give me the total dollar value of all of the public equities in Australia, and it was something like 1.8 trillion or something. Uh, from when we started our business in 2006 to uh, July this year, and then I asked him to do the same for private equity, so unlisted companies in Australia. Uh, and the unlisted companies had grown by 50%, and the listed market had not changed. All the growth is off market, and I think that people have worked this out. Uh, I think there's a lot of appetite for it. There is a big problem though, Sarah, and that is there are not very many people yet that have the experience, context, networks, and the art, and it is an art, of being able to invest that money well. So it's not about the individual making the choices. It's much, it, it is in the angel space, but it's not about the individuals making the choices. It's much more about um, uh, it's much more about um, you saying. Um, uh, it's much more, you're much more about you seeing those um, uh, those fund managers that really understand what it is to do this. So if you were going to put your money into a public fund um, that was, you know, in the papers or whatever else, then you would assume that person has got experience, 
knows what they're doing, 20 years in the game, knows how public markets work, understands short selling, understands liquidity, understands being, um, you know, IPOs, all those things. And it's the same in this market. And the problem, Sarah, is there's actually very few people that are good at it and very few people that have done it. And, um, and so that's a challenge. But the angel early stage piece, you can definitely find money. Like if you want to raise a million dollars for a really good business and a good idea, you can definitely get that money. And I don't think you need to be, it's harder if you're sort of sub 25, I think 25 to 30 uh, is a really sort of good age experience wise, uh, or even older, it would be better, but 25 and older, you could definitely get a million bucks. <laughs> Thanks Mark. I think you've covered some, uh, some other people's questions with the responses on investment and where to source that funding. Um, something quite different, this question that comes from Mitchie. Uh, who runs a coaching and consultancy business. So what she has to offer or to sell is her time rather than a scalable product. And she'd like yeah. to know if the Office of the Chief Entrepreneur will be working with businesses like that or just traditionally high growth startups. And do you yeah, so have room for self-funded startups in Queensland? And what was that last bit? And do you see room for self-funded startups in Queensland? Oh yeah, look, self-funded startups are the best way to go. <laughs> like that way, you keep all the equity. You don't have any directors or investors to report to. For God's sake, if you can do it without someone else's money, which you can absolutely do it. And the good thing about selling hours is that you can actually, and so um, so you can usually get you know generate enough cash flow to to grow your own business. But as you said, I mean, it's it's very hard um, to scale that. So the chief entrepreneur's office is not going to be investing in. Money. So what we will do is help the Advanced Queensland program get out there and we'll help connect best investors up with um, opportunities through bigger platforms but not not usually so much direct. Um, and and our, our job really in many respects is to tell the story of Queensland and to make sure that public policy and private policy or private ideas do meet up. Um, yeah, those scalable the, the businesses like yours, Michi, are, you know, are all, they've got one big advantage is you can generate cash flow quickly and you can get going and then you can grow person by person. The really hard thing is to, is to scale them. Um, but it does happen and you know I sat on a panel uh, last week uh, with a guy that had built his business up to 650 bodies selling hours and he sold that for you know 40 or 50 million dollars and, um, and it took him 15, to, uh, 15 years to do that. Um, so you, you know to, to sell a consulting business I think is a great skill. Uh, it's a great way, like it, from a private equity perspective, if you can find a consulting business that's scaling, that's magic because it doesn't require much capital expenditure, so it can be self-funded. Um, you know, from from a um, you know for all those businesses like yours, Mitchie, one of the things that I would love for us to achieve over the course of this next year is there's one really great line that Josh Lerner gave me, um, and this will be my only policy objective. Uh, for the year. Um, I think I need to keep things simple, but it's Big Bang Theory, which is, um, um, you, you know, you, you would rather have sales than subsidies. And so, uh, you know, I'm really going to be working with the government over the next 12 months to try and try and build a framework that they can, where they can apply that rule, so where they can really use that power of government procurement and the money they spend to really support uh, Queensland-based businesses, and particularly, obviously, um, the small ones and startups, and give them an opportunity to capture some sales from government. That's much better than getting an equity investor. It adds a lot more value to your company, and you learn a lot more from it. Uh, so, I think if there's one thing that I would love to achieve at the end of the 12 months, uh, that would be it. And for businesses like yours, Mitchie, that will definitely make a difference. Thanks, Mark. I know we're coming up for time. There have been a few questions uh, on this theme. Um, how are you planning to work with regional areas? There's a few yeah, people who so, like Yeah, that's a great question. I'm glad someone asked that because I'm from Warren uh, and Maury and I understand living obviously in Pittsworth and other places. So I think I really understand the, the regional challenge. Um, so, so one of the things to think about from the regional perspective is um, uh, is to try and turn that geographic weakness and access to resources into a strength. So um, categorically our experience is that if we find startups or founders or businesses that have um, started to move along or even people uh, that have come out of regional areas, uh, if they have found a way through the geographic challenges and other challenges they have living in, they actually 
they're more resilient, uh, more persistent, and they have a much higher prospect of success uh, than people from city areas. That is just our experience, and there's a fair bit of data that supports that, but that's our experience, so that's my thing. Um, so uh, so all, I think what we can do is, is we can't solve the geographic um, problem, sadly can't shift Townsville from where it is, or Dolby or, um, or Winton, it is where it is. Um, but what we can do is we can um, use some of the advanced Queensland programs to really support regional innovation and by putting in some infrastructure and some resources to give you at least a small platform from which to launch yourself on the world. Um, the next thing that we'll do, so uh, in February of this year, um, I'm going to uh, literally borrow a mate's plane. Um, I'm going to put a few people that have started their own businesses that I think are ins uh, inspirational and put them on that plane and we're going to cover as many towns as we can across uh, a five day period. So rather than do it over five months, we're just going, we'll go intensive and we'll try and cover you know, 15 or 20 towns in those five days and, uh, and connect up and go to all those regional innovation hubs and tell the story and let those entrepreneurs tell their story and, and they'll typically have a regional background. Uh, and they can explain their journey and hopefully that'll be inspirational but also hopefully they can then provide some mentorship. So um, so I think that you know the, the, the question was framed of what are you what are you going to do for regional innovation? Um, and the only thing I would say to that question it also is um, is uh, one of the one of the real challenges for Australia right now is that it's um, is that we've got a lot of in, in, you know, entitlement culture that we've got to be careful of, and um, I think that um, you know we're asking. I think personally, we're asking governments to do too much, uh, and that we've got to actually ask the government to step back a bit and let us get on with it. And um, and so for regional areas, I think that if you look at the Advanced Queensland program, there's plenty of um, solutions to the little problems in there, um, and these things will happen naturally, and the good entrepreneurs will rise to the surface. Uh, and those that want to really, really have a crack will find a way through. And we're seeing some examples of that. I'm mean, looking here at safety culture in Townsville is a great example. I mean, he raised 30 million bucks from America out of Townsville. What a legend! Uh, so there'll be there'll be heaps more people like that to say. Uh, I think that takes away that excuse. Well, you can't do it if you're in Townsville. You can actually. So um, it's just harder. But if you get there, you're probably going to succeed. Thanks, Mark. Look, we've we've already gone a little bit over time and there are still a number of questions. Now I understand that your office is uh, happy to contact those people who have submitted questions yes. and you'll provide an answer for them? Love to, yeah, absolutely love to, yeah for sure. Okay, well I think what we'll do is because I know that you have a lot um, on today, so if we could uh, just sort of finish up, are there any sort of last um, parting words you'd like to give to the um, Queensland Innovation Ecosystem members who are tuning in today. Yeah, sure. So, um, so yeah, what the thing I'd ask you to do is once we get through this Christmas New Year's lease season, is um, is take if you're taking the time to get onto this uh, webinar, which has been incredibly well organised. So, thank you for that, Leanne. Um, uh, is to get down to the precinct, uh, which is this uh, this massive. Uh, mothership operation that is going on in the valley. The valley is actually really starting to take off. So there's two things I would do if you're interested in the space is get down to the precinct and spend as much time down there as you can. The second thing that I would do is make sure you get try and find try and find a ticket. It's going to be hard to get a ticket to the Innovation Summit, uh, which will be on in late March. Uh, it is going to be extraordinary. Anyone that went to it last year, uh, I thought the job that was done by um, by the, the team on that was a 10 out of 10. Uh, but this is a new level and um, and I think that if you can get along to that by the end of March, then you and bit of the precinct, you'll be so fired up about Queensland. You'll realise that we are the entrepreneurial capital of this country, uh, and soon to be the entrepreneurial capital of Asia. Thank you, Mark, and thank you so much for giving your time today to come in uh, and talk to the people who've tuned in. It's certainly one of the most popular webinars that we've ever had, judging by the registrations and the number of people who have stayed through to the end. This uh, webinar has been recorded, so we will be making it, it available on the Innovate Queensland YouTube channel as soon as we can. Um, and also just a reminder to everybody before we go that you can stay in touch with what's happening with Innovate Queensland and we promote the Advanced Queensland programs as well via our GRID online 
forum via LinkedIn. So if you're a LinkedIn member, go in there, search for Grid Innovate Queensland, ask to join the group and uh, I'll make sure that you uh, get, get the approval to come on board and find out more. And you can also check out our website, uh, Innovate Queensland website and uh, Innovate Queensland YouTube channel. So thanks again everybody very much for tuning in. We appreciate the input that you give us with all your questions. It helps us to design the program to be responsive to your needs. So um, we'll let you know when our next webinar is happening. Thanks again also to Bron Farden who uh, has helped with organising today, making this possible. And we look forward to hearing from you again at our next webinar. Bye for now everyone.